Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this really revolting morning. Um, today, uh, I am delighted to introduce Megan Duff. Um, Megan comes from the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. And um, uh, Megan has an unusual, uh, although interesting, academic background, not the traditional background for many in the learning uh, learning design space, where many of us come with degrees in education or psychology or information science. Megan comes with three degrees in history, uh, an undergraduate mm -hmm. degree from University of Virginia. That's correct. And then your master's and your doctorate mm -hmm. from William and Mary. Mm -hmm. um, now, your professional appointments span both academia and business and industry. They do. So Megan started in the professoriate at uh, Vanderbilt in Western Kentucky, uh, and then you became an educational technology specialist at George Washington mm -hmm. before moving to Blackboard, where you were first a senior director and then a vice president. And you have done your, your you've done your homework. My history is my history is well written. <laughs> Simon, you want to talk about my dissertation research? <laughs> well, more <laughs> recently, you have become the executive director of the Personalized Learning Consortium. That's right. New organization at APLU. And today, Megan is going to share her experience in the learning management system space, and in particular, the topic of adaptive learning or adaptive learning platforms. To provide some context, I find it really interesting that one of the hottest topics in K-12 education is that of differentiated instruction, the customization of content to individual student needs. When was the last time that you took or even heard of a differentiated class at the college level? How often do college courses adapt to the learning needs of individual students? So the tools that we have available today facilitate the delivery of high quality, uh, high quality online courses. But when or should residential and online courses adapt to the individual needs of each student? As much as possible. And with that, I will pass it over to Megan. Well, thank you. Uh, it is such a delight to be here at Pennsylvania State University and with this group. Um, I understand we have some people online, so welcome and thank you also. Um, I'm excited to talk about this uh, subject with you and want to give you a little bit of background on the Personalized Learning Consortium because I think that it will help uh, frame uh, some of the remarks uh, that I have uh, this morning. So my mission professionally is to serve professional educators and to provide them with access to the technology and the professional learning support that they need to deliver transformational and, and uh, substantial instructional services to students, largely in settings where they earn credentials. And I've focused most of my career both inside of higher education and, and, and then serving it from the private sector uh, on that enterprise. And I came to APLU about 18 months ago uh, to work with a new organization of 20 public research universities, like Penn State, to advance our understanding of how to use uh, personalized and specifically adaptive learning technologies to drive student success. And we are engaging in a, a fairly carefully thought out set of interactions with funders in higher education and then the suppliers of technology to higher education to, to better understand and create products that, that enhance uh, what our teachers can deliver to their students uh, in formal and informal learning experiences. And it's, it's really that focus on creating a community of practice around understanding what we can do as we redefine what it means to deliver instruction in a higher education classroom, whether that's a physical classroom or an online classroom. And so today I want to talk about ways that we are understanding personalized learning through the lens of adaptive technologies and what that really means um, today with the suppliers that we have in the marketplace and with the ways universities are beginning to use those technologies at scale across their institutions. So I will click through a couple of slides. Um, these are the members of the Personalized Learning Consortium. Um, you'll see that, like Penn State, many of them are, are very large, very diverse institutions. 
some are leaders, um, as you are in uh, online learning and have large global or world campuses. Um, I teach uh, for one of these institutions, uh, the University of Massachusetts at Boston through their UMass online program. And uh, I think we have a number of other institutions that are, uh, are doing other forward-looking work that will impact classroom experiences, but are doing it through the lenses of learning analytics and data analysis. And so we have a good group that we've brought together. Um, one of the reasons this group was formed, and it, it, it developed prior to my arrival at APLU, was an understanding, and I think it's reflected in these trends from the New Media Consortium Report of 2014, that personalized learning was really going to be a key driver in changing U.S. higher education, and hopefully it's going to be in changing U.S. higher education uh, for the better. If we look at the trends that they identified, again, this is probably about 18 months ago now that this report was produced, they saw six trends uh, that were driving change. Four relate directly to personalized learning. Uh, and they have implications for public universities as they think about how they need to be oriented at the leadership level. And this morning, I want to explore these trends in the context of adaptive learning, paying special attention to the pedagogical, to the organizational, and the personal implications of the, of the technology itself. Now, if you're attending this COIL conversation, you've probably already heard about, or, or perhaps you've even tried a set of the next generational uh, learning technologies that are promising, I think quite boldly, really, to assess student learning in real time and to support students in guiding themselves. Broadly characterized as adaptive learning platforms or adaptive courseware, these solutions challenge faculty and other pedagogical experts to reconsider their roles as content authors, teachers, tutors, graders, and overall creators of educational experiences for students. Our modern universities are now a mix of analog and digital worlds, and students and faculty members reasonably expect everything from courses to books to be delivered digitally so that they can access information anywhere and everywhere at any time on almost any device or application that they're inclined to use every day. Today's students are also, as we're told so often by the media, digital natives who want to use their smartphones and their tablets and their laptop computers. But when it comes to teaching and learning using technology, a lot of our campus officials across the United States worry whether students are actually getting the best educational experience on these devices and through these mediums. Fewer than percent of officials say that their campuses are actually innovative in how they're thinking about deploying digital learning and giving their faculty the support that they need. This data comes from a, a survey that was done by the Chronicle of Higher Education in, in, uh, in association with the Huron Consulting Group. They actually surveyed about 260 uh, university leaders to really uh, to ask them, you know, what do you think are the innovations? that have the most hope of improving higher education in the future. Because the modern university is now that mix of an analog and a digital world, we, we really need to be reflective when we think about how are these tools going to be most impactful. So if you go down the list, uh, the, the technologies that we see at the top, right, lecture capture uh, and, and, and open educational resources, these are things that we've had in our, in our ecosystem for a long time. These, these aren't new technologies in any way. And they largely replicate existing images and materials that we've used historically, the lecture uh, and, the, and the educational material itself. But if we look further down the list, when, when people look for the innovations that they think will be most transformative, they begin to identify adaptive learning and transitions in the actual format that we're delivering the instruction, moving from a historically largely face-to-face -to, -face to an online and now later to a blended or a hybrid component for how we're delivering that instruction. If we ask what value, what educational value does the hybrid course uh, provide relative to an in-person course, I think we've come a long way. According to this survey, now 46% think that the, the, the blended course, that hybrid approach, is actually much better than, than formally teaching um, in just a face-to-face -face environment or teaching in just an online, in an online world. Uh, and if you add it not much better or worse, you know, we have far and away the preponderance of people seeing this as an attractive sort of destination for how we're going to be delivering this kind of instruction. 
When asked what technology innovations will have the most positive impact on American higher education in the future, campus officials agreed that among the range of innovative solutions uh, you know, in the mix, that hybrid courses were most likely to have a positive impact on higher education. And they were also optimistic about the ability of adaptive learning to personalize education. But their opinions about other things, competency-based education, prior learning assessment, and, and, and the now, I think, um, uh, uh, well, I'll just leave my, my, my ideas on MOOCs aside, uh, but the, the well-explored uh, potential of MOOCs to transform education ranked near the bottom uh, in terms of their long-term positive impact on higher education. Now, I'll, I'll remind you about the survey. These are, this is a survey not of, uh, of leaders generically, but of leaders inside of higher education, right? So they would uh, likely be inclined to have some of those uh, uh, perspectives by default. When we think about what the next generation of educational technologies can offer, I do think we want to look at those three words I have on the screen, personalized, hybridized, and quantified. The next generation of educational technologies and every single vendor that calls me every week promises end user tools that are going to help educators assess student learning in real time and support students in guiding themselves. And it seems so simple, and it is really so difficult to provide technology-based tools that can do those two things, can help educators assess student learning in real time, and then support students in guiding themselves and making good decisions about their learning path and their learning practice. And broadly characterized as adaptive learning platforms, and sometimes more specifically as adaptive courseware, these solutions are challenging faculty and pedagogical experts to reconsider all of the different ways in which they're delivering material. If we think about personalization, we mean the growing capabilities and willingness to use digital resources to create custom pathways for learning and degree success. One of the clearest illustrations of this development uh, might be uh, MIT's exploration of its breaking of courses down into learning rules and enabling students and instructors to reassemble those modules to conduct, connect personal pathways, uh, a process likened to constructing a playlist in iTunes or uh, in your favorite streaming media service. Developments such as these are beginning to lend credence to the suggestion that we have entered sort of the post-course era in higher education, in which the course is no longer really the fundamental building block for how we think about developing a personalized learning experience. Yet at the same time, we're still delivering courses, and we're doing it through expensive technologies like learning management systems, which become the organizing framework for how we are delivering an educational experience. So how can we balance our interest in personalization with our organizational inclination to invest in large systems that create a framework like a course or a program or network of courses that results in uh, the attainment of a credential by a student? One of the ways we can do this is in an adoption of a hybridized learning model, uh, particularly one that might be adaptive. The footprint of online dimension is expanding across all universities, uh, even in universities unlike Penn State that don't have dedicated world campuses and haven't created large separate organizations um, like the University of Massachusetts has through UMass Online or Arizona State University has in their programs. But all universities are, to a large degree, uh, expanding into online uh, delivery methods. And now that the affair with MOOCs has seemingly come to an end, uh, we have seen that there is a lasting impact from those experiences. We've greatly accelerated in the last 10 years the migration of higher education into an online world. And in addition, this characteristic is intertwined with, um, with first instructors and then instructional designers and now students starting to invent and modify learning models and pathways that they're developing to achieve more personal learning goals. And as we talk this morning, I want us to, to make sure that when we consider how we are personalizing learning, that we keep students on the table or in the agent of that personalization, that we don't think about personalizing learning as something that instructors and learning designers and pedagogical experts are doing to and for students. It is something, it is a process that students are participating in and that they have definitional responsibility for what that means. Because they ultimately have to create the learning goals. Uh, Malcolm Brown has observed that digital technology is the fabric of nearly everything that's associated with teaching and learning. 
he writes that we can think of this fact as an overarching trajectory. Digital technology is the core strategic enabler of learning in higher education. But here there's a twist. Our thinking about digital technology in higher education is shifting away from seeing it as IT infrastructure and instead toward conceiving it as digital learning environment. For those of us who've worked in higher education information technology for a long time, this is a really significant shift in our thinking. It means that the technology is no longer in the foreground. Instead, our attention is focused on the learners and the learning experiences, and that the technology enables this learning. It sets for all campus players the ambitious goal of creating a learning ecosystem that is responsive and can be personalized for and by the learner. Malcolm Brown, who I have been neglected to mention, uh, at it, who is uh, working with Educause, has identified six uh, trajectories for digital learning technologies. Um, not predictions uh, for the future, but rather uh, trends and trajectories for where we see these, these enterprises. Um, the first we've touched on, um, ubiquitous device ownership of smart technologies and mobile first modalities is really changing the way people consume information. Uh, a much greater attention to and enthusiasm among educators for using open educational resources, uh, particularly, I think, in the last two to three years, we've seen an explosive interest there, one that both individual educators and suppliers are beginning to capitalize on. Uh, the third and my favorite, adaptive learning technologies. Fourth, the development of more flexible learning spaces, which we can see just across the hall here uh, in the in the significant investments that institutions are making in reconceiving the physical spaces in which we learn and teach. Uh, next, next generation learning management systems. Uh, you've adopted Canvas here at Penn State, and I know you're going to be going through the transition of moving from Angel onto the Canvas platform. Uh, and that will shape and contribute to the way you experience all of these new technologies, because today, and this is unchanged, the learning management system is the anchoring platform for how teachers and students are getting access to, to other kinds of educational tools and technologies. And then finally, uh, something that we'll, we won't explore in depth today, but is critically important, learning analytics and the development of integrated planning and advising systems to manage student success and try to help students improve their performance, um, persist at their institutions, and earn degrees in a timely and a cost-effective manner. All right, adaptive learning. I probably waited too long to get to that topic uh, in focus. Uh, so what is it? This is the definition that I like the best right now. Uh, it actually comes from a study that Titan Partners did in 2013 in their analysis of the early adaptive learning supplier landscape. And it says, as an approach to creating a personalized learning experience for students, Adaptive learning takes a sophisticated, data-driven, and in some cases, nonlinear approach to instruction and remediation, adjusting to a learner's interactions and demonstrated performance level, and subsequently anticipating what content and resources learners need to make progress at a specific point in time. Can anybody tell me what word is not here that you might have expected to see? Course. The course isn't the course isn't part of this definition, and that's one of the reasons I like this definition. As we think about what adaptive learning is, we don't need to think of adaptive learning necessarily in a course context. We do have to think about learning resources. We do have to think about the, the agency of learners and educators. We have to think about uh, the paths that people take. But we don't need to think about a course. And as we think about why um, adaptive learning is, uh, is important. It's important not just because it's the next thing. It's important because it has the potential to change the way we think about the present thing around which we build and orient so much of our activity in teaching and learning on a college campus. Why is adaptive learning popular with students? Um, It meets the educational demands that students have uh, in the time and the place where they're learning. Uh, it can be self-paced. It can offer technologically rich uh, learning experiences in an online environment. Um, this is 
more than evident in recent surveys, particularly of adult learners. Um, in its 2000 survey of adult learners, Edge Adventures found that in addition to lower tuition, which is always popular, self-paced learning most entices prospective adults to go back to school and observed that increased personalization is very attractive to adult learners, especially when coupled with practical, measurable instruction, which adaptive learning surely facilitates. Post-secondary education institutions with adopt adult learner populations um, and significant adult learner populations are implementing adaptive technologies uh, much more quickly and much more aggressively than other institutions that are um, more traditionally described uh, or are described as more traditional uh, institutions. In fact, the preponderance of universities implementing adaptive learning today are large, highly innovative. They're typically public institutions, and they serve incredible percentages and proportions of adult students in primarily online learning situations. So who am I talking about here? I'm talking about so I'm talking about the University of Maryland University College, I'm talking about ASU Online. These are the kinds of programs and the, uh, that, are, that are moving aggressively in the direction of implementations of adaptive learning. What does adaptive learning require of educators? As students and instructors generate more and more data through their use of online learning technologies, there's a growing interest in using tools and algorithms to reveal patterns inherent in those data and apply them to the improvement of the instructional systems to really try to create that feedback loop between what the learner is doing, what the educator understands the learner is doing and needs in order to progress, and how they can improve the systems that those uh, people are using through that educational process. Most learning management systems today do offer dashboards that provide teachers and students with an overview of course performance. Uh, and many universities are successfully connecting the analysis of data in course management systems and learning systems to uh, other kinds of solutions that are for aiding retention and student success at a, at a much more um, uh, uh, programmatic or departmental or campus level. While faculty can act on the information that they get in a course dashboard to personalize interventions for students, it's really, really time and labor intensive. And in fact, in many teaching and learning environments, faculty don't actually have access to that course data to really, and the time to analyze that data at an individual level and then make changes in their instruction in the context of the you know, 12 to 14 week semester, if it's a more traditional environment or potentially the three and a half week term that might be in a, in a less traditional format. While faculty can, can do their best, we haven't positioned them for success in any real way in using the data generated through student engagement with online learning tools. It is, many people think, that facilitator driven that has created the uh, preoccupation that many of these technologies have with dashboards and these kinds of tools in and of themselves. It's, I, I don't want to suggest any malfeasance here, but one of the reasons that we have an obsession with dashboards inside of higher education right now is because it's about keeping the power to make decisions in the hands of the educators themselves. Few of the products that we're actively using today at scale have dashboards that are given to students so that they understand their own performance toward the course objectives and those learning goals. One of the attributes of adaptive learning provides that data and analysis and in a fashion that's easily consumable, not just the instructor of the course or the course facilitator, but can be more easily understood and accessed by the individual learner about their own performance and their performance relative to their peers. And, and what we have found in implementations of adaptive learning technologies that are successfully providing to learners is that it has the potential to enhance learner performance and change learner behavior in ways that improve their educational outcomes. But we aren't doing it in a systematic way today, and we certainly are not today doing that at scale. What do we need to be able to do that most effectively? Well, we really need a much more assessment-driven uh, approach, uh, an approach that creates tools and technologies and implements them uh, in a way that creates an ongoing evaluation of a learner's performance that results in much more dynamic near or near real-time adjustments in instructional content, learning resources, 
so that the course pathways that students take do become more personalized to what their needs are at any given point in time and alleviates the responsibility of assessing students formally at many or in, uh, in worst case scenarios two points across a traditional semester. How can we ever hope to improve our delivery of instruction if we are relying on assessment data that we collect once or twice a year. And I know that I'm, over, I'm, I'm oversimplifying this to a large degree, but it isn't reasonable to expect educators to create more personalized learning experiences for their students if we don't give them much more actionable data for them to use and do it in a way that is going to reduce the administrative burden of improving and changing their delivery models. One example of this might be an asynchronous online statistics course in which individual students proceed through a common set of learning objectives in different ways and at different rates. Assessment-driven solutions require an ability to correlate assets, items, and learning objects to standards, outcomes, and other frameworks. Some sophisticated assessment-driven solutions model and categorize learners through the aggregation of cognitive and non-cognitive data and development of a learner profile. This profile enables the adaptive learning application to recommend and to personalize a learner's experience through a combination of previously modeled paths and through content and various objectives. But that requires a comfort level on the part of the institution and the faculty member with the idea that we are creating that learner profile and that we will use the aggregate experience of learners through that course over time to inform the lessons and learning activities that we provide to the student we are teaching today. A lot of people aren't necessarily comfortable with the idea, and this is where we start to hear a lot of people talk about an adaptive learning platform as a black box, where they don't understand what the algorithms are doing. But in and of itself, the purpose of that type of analysis is to take the collective experience of learners in a content-related situation, to model that experience, and to use that model to inform the way we manage the learning activities of the student who's in front of us today. And we can do that in a, in a cohort-based way, in the context of a course or a large class. We can do that with a one-to-one -one tutoring system. Uh, we can do that in lots of different ways with lots of different scale. What we, what we have to, though, understand is that it is an experience that we are creating for learners that is based not exclusively on their own performance. It's based on a model that has been created by analyzing the experiences of many, many different learners over time. So what do you need to build systems that are able to do this? Well, suppliers need institutions, need customers who are providing them with learners experiences that they're modeling. These systems have the potential based on the science and the technology today to become smarter over time, but they are dependent upon how we use them and what kind of information feedback loop we create, what kinds of partnerships do we manage with the suppliers of the technology today. And finally, it requires a really a cultural change in the way we think about that education experience as educators, that we are not just educating the student in front of us today based on everything that we know about the content, that we are educating the student in front of us today based upon everything we know about the content, everything that learner brought to the classroom in their prior learning experience, and what we know systematically from having taught that content in hundreds of thousands of teaching and learning environments where that similar concept was taught at our institution and institutions globally. And that's a, that's a big bet. That's a big bet for an individual faculty member to take. It's probably not a reasonable risk for an individual faculty member to take, but collectively as an industry, uh, or as an institution, it's a conversation that we really need to be willing to engage with. How do we evaluate adaptive learning solutions? Um, this is a model uh, from uh, Titan Partners from a study that I referenced earlier, and, and there are footnotes included in the slides. Um, Faculty and other institutional stakeholders generally want to understand how solutions work, uh, including a set of descriptive solutions that address issues such as the you know, openness of the content model or the scope of coverage of the course, how well it interoperates with other institutional resources like a learning management system, what kind of embedded support and services are there for learners. Um, this is a model that was created uh, to help uh, 
evaluate a set of the initial learning, uh, adaptive learning solution providers. And I think that we're going to see the development of uh, even more robust uh, tools and frameworks that will help higher education institutions uh, compare and understand the, uh, the approaches that different technologies are, are taking to trying to personalize and make more adaptive uh, teaching and learning. But, but it does offer, um, I think, a set of, of, of things that we can use today as we think about, you know, do we like this product versus that product? You know, many of them include a learner profile or build a learner profile through the use of the system. And what do you want to think of a learner profile as? Well, really, at, at root, it's just a structured repository of information uh, that's used to inform the personal learning experience. And, you know, some people the learner DNA. Some people will just call it, you know, the profile. Some won't refer to it at all as a feature of an application, but it is it's really embedded uh, as a foundational concept in the way they actually deliver um, their product. A unit of adaptivity typically refers to the structure of the instructional content and the scale at which it's broken down. So are we talking about something that is at the module level, uh, something at the learning object level, or something even more atomic than that? Instructional coverage is really just about the flexibility of a product uh, to deliver an adaptive learning experience uh, within the context of a course. Assessment, as, as you probably all know, is just the frequency and the format and the conditions under which you evaluate a learner, uh, whether that's something that is happening in real time uh, as students would, would read, watch, or engage with content, or something that happens in a more summative way uh, at the middle or the end of a, of a learning unit. The content model describes the accessibility of the product's authoring environment, you know, the degree to which it's open and faculty uh, or other uh, learning designers can create an author uh, or whether it's closed. Um, so are you buying a, a solution that is a whole course solution that is simply to replace the textbook that you would historically have adopted in that course? Or is it something that, that you're going to be putting your own content and others' content into, uh, customizing uh, and authoring uh, and changing over time? And then Bloom's coverage uh, highlights the extent to which a product can support the learning objectives within the cognitive domain of Bloom's taxonomy. Well-designed learning, adaptive learning experiences and, and, and products uh, have, have common approaches and attributes. Um, you can use the framework that, that I, I just showed to, to compare and contrast their approaches and, and the potential that they might offer. But at the end of the day, they're all using learning outcomes, um, understanding what students know and should be able to do at the end of the experience. That experience can be as small as a lesson or as large as a course. Um, content, which typically, um, because of the nature of the solutions, is multimedia and intended to uh, foster student engagement, although it is not in and of itself necessarily an attribute of an adaptive learning experience. And then uh, embedded assessments and activities that, that are uh, providing opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning by doing. Um, in, in the most basic, that can be answering multiple choice questions. Uh, but there are more sophisticated ways to do that with, uh, with interactive simulations uh, and, and with uh, tools that are more robust in uh, their delivery of, of rich learning experiences. The, the products that, that, that do these things look and, and vary widely. I'll, I'll just show you sort of some screenshots from two and won't name them. But if you imagine that we have learning outcomes, which it's really hard to see, and my apologies, uh, are identified uh, at the top and on the left. Uh, we have the instructional content as it's presented on the right. And then at the bottom, we have the activities and the assessments. Uh, that are embedded in that experience. And again, in the real product, they aren't all on the screen at the same time. I've created this as a, a composite. Um, but something can look like this, or it could look like this, which I think has the much more conventional look and feel of your typical learning management system course, but at the end of the day has largely accomplished the same things with the, with the, um, the learning objectives on the left and the, the content uh, uh, at the top and the assessment in the middle. <laughs> um, uh, and the second one was Cogbooks, and they're from their 
publicly available material, so I'm not. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, adaptive learning technologies typically use uh, various learning science methods to inform product design. And um, when I first came into this position at APLU and working with the Personalized Learning Consortium, and, and really for the first time in my career, digging into the research around adaptive learning uh, and, and getting to know what these concepts, for the most part, mean. I'm not a learning scientist, uh, but trying to get some fluency around that. And then so I could talk with suppliers about, well, does your product you leverage this and does it leverage that? And the salespeople at these companies, they don't use this language. But the product development people in many of these uh, organizations absolutely do. So I think that if you are an individual that is, uh, if you are a learning designer, if you are someone that's you know procuring and implementing these technologies, uh, it, it I think it is incumbent upon you to have a general understanding of the learning science methods uh, and the efficacy research underpinning those methods so that you can make an evaluation of whether or not this particular adaptive learning product might be effective in this particular teaching and learning situation. Um, they aren't positive or negative. They, they just they are attributes and they can influence the way that a, a product will work in a various uh, 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 learning experience. I think that um, uh, it isn't really necessary for faculty to understand this uh, conceptually if it is well outside of their discipline. I don't think that I, for example, really need to know what spaced repetition is to understand that if I'm learning a set of biology terms and there is a significant level of memorization required just up front to, to master those definitions, that the tool that I'm using to do that is employing spaced repetition and that that is an important you know, concept in learning science to, to drive recall. Maybe I just need to have a product that successfully helps my students practice their understanding of these terms in advance of coming to a class where I am going to talk and work with them about those concepts. Um, the, the, the analogy, uh, and I'm a historian, so you'll appreciate this, I work for uh, uh, APLU's chief academic officer who is a computer scientist. There is considerable gulf between our understanding of technology. Mine is highly experiential. His is very much uh, in the, uh, uh, the nuts and bolts of the way things are built. Um, but the analogy that we've settled on is I can use the calculator to do the math. I don't necessarily have to know how all of that math worked to appreciate and to benefit from that answer. And I think the same can be true for a lot of faculty members. It isn't necessary that they understand the importance of cognitive scaffolding. It is important that they understand why their course needs to have learning objectives and how those learning objectives are made apparent through the activities and the assessment items that they choose to incorporate in that course and the transparency that their students can, can have in understanding what they're expected to know, learn and be able to do at the end of a learning experience. So different solution providers. You know, I'm not going to talk a lot about, OK, I'm really not going to talk about any of them specifically. Um, and I know that we'll have time for open conversation, and I'm looking forward to that. I will say that today's higher education marketplace um, has a tremendous number of companies that are working in personalizing learning and, and are offering adaptive learning solutions with the air quotes around that. Um, I think that within the actual adaptive learning space, institutions generally have choices between a platform and an authoring tool provider and various commercial publishers uh, who bundle instructional content, whether it's proprietary or open with the technology um, and uh, incorporates a level of adaptivity. The platform-oriented tools um, deliver infrastructure and services that enable the adaptive learning model to be developed and then delivered. Um, examples of notable platforms include Acrobatic, Cerego, Cogbooks, Fishtree, Newton, Lumen Learning, Realize It, Smart Sparrow, uh, and this list is not exhaustive. While these companies um, are, for the most part, uh, content agnostic and can be applied across a wide range of disciplines, uh, many do target certain subjects or discipline areas on which they're focusing. Uh, many of these are smaller companies and um, you know, aren't necessarily building catalogs of adaptive courseware that cover all topics in higher education. 
Uh, we see a preponderance of solutions working in the, in the physical and natural sciences, in mathematics, in engineering, um, in language learning, and in test prep. I think those are areas where we see a high degree of activity among these providers today. The, uh, the commercial publishers are uh, also getting in, involved in personalizing and adaptive learning um, solution building. And some of them are doing this to diversify their business model uh, and to reposition themselves as learning companies. Um, newer digital publishing and content service providers uh, are delivering exclusively online resources and tools. Um, to date, the efforts uh, have tended to represent an extension of the textbook model. Uh, the idea that you may have a printed book, but you're also going to have a, a, a full course solution that reflects that digital content. It may not require or even recommend the purchasing of the physical or printed book. Um, these companies are moving to acquire some of this, the, the platforms and tool providers, most recent example being uh, uh, Cengage Learning's acquisition of learning objects. Uh, but others uh, have done this. Uh, McGraw McGraw Hill Education acquired the, the, the product that has become the Alex platform, and then there are many others in this way. Some, like Wiley, uh, have, have built a business around supporting the implementation of adaptive learning technologies by other vendors, bringing their professional services expertise and working with faculty to the table in that regard. Uh, so there's lots of different ways that these companies are working in this space. So I, I want to make sure we get quickly to, um, uh, to the conversation part, and, and I, I hope I have taken too long with my remarks. Um, I do think that we, we need to really understand where we can go from here. In, in addition to thinking about whether we want a platform-based approach that's content agnostic or a publisher approach um, that may leverage uh, content that we've been teaching with for a long time but delivering it in a new and a more powerful way, University leaders should consider whether they are trying to innovate with these solutions within their existing course programs and paradigms or are seeking to more dramatically transform uh, what they're doing. As universities investigate adaptive learning, a comprehensive self-appraisal of key operating and instructional characteristics really is needed to determine which approach might best fit with an institution and improve its chances for personalized learning successfully. We really hope that the Personalized Learning Consortium uh, will provide Penn State and other public research universities with a forum for sharing those experiences. But ultimately, the adoption of adaptive learning by faculty and implemented at scale across universities will be driven by the ability of these technologies to deliver meaningful outcomes in terms of student learning goals, completion objectives at both the course and the program level. And to that end, the key input for institutional and faculty consideration really does revolve around evidence and, and, and use case examples that credibly demonstrate the impact on student learning. Some of the early results are very promising. Um, you know, ASU, in their collaboration with Newton, reported highly positive outcomes in their math instruction uh, at the developmental level. Uh, the University System Maryland, in use of a product called OLI, which was the progenitor of acrobatics solution today, reported outcomes that were highly, highly positive. We expect a forthcoming report from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation either by the end of this year or early next on the early, uh, the adaptive learning experiences of a set of grantees uh, that implemented adaptive learning at considerable scale at those at the grantee institutions uh, in 2014. But we're still really in the early days, and um, most of these uh, technology implementations are still focused at the course level. But if you consider that the potential for developing all of these ever larger data sets uh, based on different kinds of learner interactions, forming an ever richer profile of our learners, that the full promise of adaptive learning doesn't really reside in its use by a faculty member in the context of a course, but at the level of the learner themselves. And the power of these systems will increase as they follow the learner across a range of courses that's covering a particular domain or a range of skills or a set of interests. And as we think about individual educators adopting these solutions, I think I want to close by saying that there is considerable risk around adaptive learning as it's, as it's being described in the marketplace today uh, in creating a two-tiered educational system in, in post-secondary education, 
where we have adaptive learning technology driven education for the have nots and human delivered, human facilitated education in more traditional learning environments, whether those are online or face to face for the haves. And it really is incumbent upon the faculty and the pedagogical experts and the administrators at public research universities where we educate both kinds of students, the haves and the have nots, to make adaptive learning the, 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 the opportunity for all learners so that adaptive learning's promise can be fulfilled for students across the spectrum. And if we think about what our role as individual educators is, how can we use these technologies to the advantage of all of our learners so that we don't create a situation where the best and the brightest or the, the better resourced among us can have a classroom-based experience, whether that's, again, at a physical classroom or online, but everybody else is sitting in front of a terminal working their way through a, a, a computer science-driven project that's simply modeling their behavior. We want to have something, we want to strive to be greater than that. This, this technology is very promising, but I think it is also prompting us to have to really stand up and think about how do we intend to use it and to whose benefit, and what is the role of the faculty member, what is the role of the educator in taking a position on that issue. So I'll close with that. So at that point, if we have any questions in the room or if we have any questions online, uh, if you're online and have a question, please go ahead and type your question in the chat box. Is there anyone in the room with questions? Simon, you're already mic'd up, so you can go ahead. Um, so um, Megan, I'm, I'm really interested in behavior change. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of research done for an extended time period that looks at behavior change in areas like weight cessation, exercise, smoking. Um, and uh, I was involved in a project at the university, an analy analytics project. And one of the more depressing outcomes of the research was that we found that the students who accessed the analytics system that we were designing, in general, tended to be those who needed it least. Mm. Um, they were. Um, uh, the students who were already predicted to be most successful in the course, and those people who we were really hoping to, ha uh, to impact um, uh, rarely use the, analy the analytic system. Yep. How do we go about thinking about behavior change with adaptive instruction and using data? Right. So I, I think that with adaptive learning technologies, you have to keep the human interaction at the center of the use of those technologies. Um, you know, shuffling someone off to a lab to work through a set of homework problems, and, and, or, or putting a child in front of um, Khan Academy, that isn't what creates the, the change in the learner behavior that, that we want to see. That's just homework. What we really want to do is provide instructional environments and, and learning opportunities that will empower the learner to see the full scope of what is expected of them and, and, and an understanding, a transparency around what the role of that facilitator, that instructor is in that experience. And then it creates this occasion where um, there can be discussion and intervention, and I mean human-mediated intervention, when people need assistance. And that creates a qualitatively better experience for the learner. But we also know that that drives better outcomes over time for the aggregate of learners in that way. But it's, it's a process of getting to that point. And people have to reset the way they think about their teaching and learning environment when they're doing this. And I don't just mean on the faculty side. The early research you know, shows that in, in courses that have implemented a higher amount of adaptive adaptivity, Students have to do more work, and it, it changes the, the Im implicit contract they entered into when they came to university, which was that I was going to go to the tiered lecture hall, and I was going to sit down, and they would be talking at me, and I would take notes or not, and then there would be assessment. Well, this inverts that entire experience, right? This is hard. And, and when you deliver these kinds of adaptive um, technologies as your platform, Student evaluations drop, and faculty members need to expect that. 
we have also evidence that students at the end of those experiences sometimes want those experiences a lot more and they begin to recognize that they have learned more or they have learned in a way that actually is more enjoyable for them and more suited to their, whether that's actually the way they learn best, whether they simply believe that that is better for them from an experiential perspective. But that's a process of resetting. And I think your analogy with Weight Watchers or you know behavioral economics, I think that those are really good analogies. And we should mine those learnings for what that means about the way we transform an educational experience. Because those human um, uh, behaviors are going to have an impact not just on what the learner perceives to be the quality of the experience, but how enjoyable the faculty member finds the quality of that experience. And some faculty members really like the performance aspect of teaching, and others really like the tutoring aspect of teaching. This model with adaptive learning favors the latter group rather decisively. And I'm not saying that we get rid of the performance aspect of, of, of education. I like lectures. I enjoy learning things I know a little about from an expert who knows a lot about them in a lecture environment. That's not necessarily how I want to learn about something else. And so I think that it's about hiring a professoriate and training them to be able to either specialize and just say that, or expect that we have, you know, broader ways that we demonstrate our educational abilities as as teachers uh, and that we're requiring them to be able to. Crystal, thank you so much for coming and sharing your thoughts. Um, I have a question about the role of the faculty in contrast between flipped classroom and adaptive learning uh, classroom. In that I was looking at the definition, and I'm seeing Simon and Kyle sitting here. And I'm looking at the definition, and I can imagine both of them being in here for the graduate seminar with three students, and what they're doing is exactly what you said with adaptive learning technology. They may not have normal data, yeah. but they're using their experience to do exactly what adaptive learning technology does. Mm -hmm. So what I'm seeing, replacement. Now when you look at, from my understanding, of flipped classrooms, what you've done is to really elevates the role of the faculty because the lecture is somewhat a commodity, mm -hmm. and they're coming to class to work in projects, on teams, problem solving, homework. Yep. So to me, with the Flip classroom, it elevates the role of the faculty. In, a, in the adaptive learning, the way the definition was, it seems to replace. And I kind of wanted your. Um, I think what I would say is that the flipped classroom approach puts the data collection for the faculty member in the physical classroom experience, right? I, the lecture gets watched before they come to class. And in the flipped classroom, I'm getting all the data about whether they ap appreciated that lecture and learned what they were supposed to learn from it and can now move on to demonstrating that learning by doing component in the flipped classroom experience, all that data collection happens face to face. In an adaptive learning approach, which you could do use an adaptive learning technology in a physical classroom, but that's not typically how it's been done so far, is that that experience, that data collection, that embedded assessment of the student's performance is happening when the student is in the technology and then that data is available to the instructor before they enter into the physical classroom. And they're, they're taking and they're doing that analysis of that data. And then they're bringing to the classroom whatever's needed to move that learner or cohort of learners forward. The data collection happened earlier. Now, experienced educators will say, anytime I'm in a classroom, whether it's a flipped classroom or a traditional one, I'm getting data from my students about how well they understand. You're all nodding right now. so I clearly just said something that, that you agreed with. So it isn't that simple, but it's the, it's the quality of the data, and it is the, the amount of information that we have about the individual that is different. I think that when you are in a traditional learning environment, the volume of data that you can leverage using your brain and your eyes is much smaller than the amount of data that could be analyzed for you that you could use in shaping your next teaching activity if you have uh, if you are using an adaptive solution, again, paired uh, with, uh, with other kinds of instruction. And I wouldn't put my own children in a, in a fully exclusively adaptive learning experience. I do want their instruction to be as personalized as is appropriate. But um, you know, I don't think we're all going to be sitting in front of terminals self-educating. And I don't think there's a risk of that. And I think that there's a lot of hyperbole that that might be what happens. But I, I don't see that even as a, a, a scenario. Hi. Hi. So 
I worry more about preserving the social aspect than the than the lecture. So it's one thing the the, the teacher's role in presenting information can I think be uh, turned over, but learning is a largely social thing. Have you uh, seen good examples of where adaptive learning has been used in in especially online adaptive learning? in contexts where there are other things that are done to enhance peer collaboration and, right. and real-time support. Um, no. Go there first. I mean, I would say I have seen deployments of adaptive learning in blended instructional environments where there was a robust face-to-face -face experience or other online experience in a discussion board forum or something that's not adaptive and that the adaptive, the adaptive learning part of the course was um, uh, just part of it. And it happened in a broader educational context. I'm working with a group of English composition faculty right now that are building adaptive courseware for freshman composition. And they are committed to working with our, our selected adaptive learning platform provider to develop peer review. Right, and the idea that you're going to build in a, a somewhat social component. Now, it's not necessarily conceived of being a real-time social component, but that there would be interactivity between students. You know, it's important, um, but in the in the hierarchy of things that certain kinds of learners and the and and the the new learners, the adult learners, are bringing to the table. Socialization is pretty low on their list of things that they're concerned about. They need, you know, access and affordability and, um, you know, short time to completion. They they don't prioritize that as highly yeah. as you do. I think I, I think I might have used the word social. <clears throat> Just to think of social learning theory means that we learn a whole in context of conversation with other people. Ah. I don't really mean that they're in there the to context be of a group. And make new friends and things yeah. like that. What, what I was getting at is more like. What if there was like a Zoom room uh, where after you go through a certain aspect of it, you go there and talk about thing X, concept X, mm -hmm. and you go there at a specific time and there might be seven other people there right. where you can have a real-time synchronous conversation with other people about those concepts. Would you give you a chance to say, well, you know, I didn't really get this or right. I see it differently. The kind of conversation that's going on in the chat right. here alongside your conversation. Or you, you, you engaged with the adaptive platform. This doesn't exist. I'm going to make this up. But you engage with the adaptive platform, and you perform poorly, and you get sh shuttled to a place with a learner that actually just cruised through that, that activity. And then the experience is the skilled student has to reteach the concept to the, to the student that hadn't yet gotten it at all. Yeah, we even talked about that with sort of like a, an economy built around that. So as you help people, they give, you can give you help. You know, Points right. that you can use to get tutoring from someone else. So build a sort of right. a support community inside. And a few, I mean, it's different, but a few of the, I mean, I've talked with a couple of the adaptive platform providers about building in uh, uh, tools where faculty members whose content is most used through the instruction of different kinds of concepts and different kinds of courses have higher or lower ratings based on the number of people who've used that and the number of learners who have performed well using their content, right? So you, have, you build in that sort of social rating system around the efficacy of what the faculty member has contributed to education. So actually, we are all out of oh, time no. uh, for this session. However, that is a perfect segue into uh, advertising. We will be having a 1 o'clock open conversation with Megan. Unfortunately, we will not be streaming that. Uh, that won't be uh, online. Uh, but if you're anywhere near 221 Chambers, please come join us. There is no registration required. Uh, you can come and join us for that. We'll have an hour open conversation where we can just have a, a dialogue as an extension of this event. So I want to thank Megan well, thank Duff you. for being here with us today. Thank uh, everyone in our audience for the great questions and engagement. And hope to see you at our next COIL conversation. Thank you very much.